So this is where we get into the applications of this system that we have talked about in the previous talk. This is the summary of <coughs> what we said. The re universal rewrite self-organized process uh, generates new totality zero, nil potent alphabets. I'm sorry, I've not explained nil potent yet, but I will do shortly. Whereby sub-alphabet, alphabet becomes alphabet, nothing new, alphabet, alphabet, new alphabet. Okay. And the, and the, the new symbol can be an entire alphabet, sub-alphabet, or a single character, or anything you want, anything at all. And this sort of process, you feel, goes on all the time. So we've got an application of the system to mathematics with binary arithmetic, digital logic, and Clifford algebra as consequences rather than starting assumptions. And the fact that it becomes repetitive with the algebra of three-dimensional space also suggests that it might apply to the physical world as well. Because the one thing that we observe more than anything, and we've observed it for centuries or millennia, is that we live in a three-dimensional space. And that's a very unusual thing to expect if, uh, if there was not something more fundamental explaining it. Now, um, if it applies to the physical world, we might expect that it's not one alphabet that applies to the physical world, but every alphabet, every possible alphabet we can have. And that each applies independently. And in a sense, we will find that does. Also, the presence of a repeating unit might suggest that we don't need to keep extending the alphabet indefinitely, but that we can somehow build the repetition and self-similarity into the structure. So even though it does go on to infinity, we can structure it in such a way as we don't need to explicitly do that. And in fact, there is a particular way we can do exactly this. And we can describe the indefinite extension using just the first four alphabets. And these then take on a special physical significance. What we want to describe is the physical world as we know it. And as far as we know, there is only, in the universe, there are only fermions, things like electrons, and their interactions. Everything else is a version of that. Nothing we know actually lies outside that. <coughs> and space, time, all the interactions are manifestations of fermion structure. So if we can solve the structure of these particles, then in that sense we can solve physics. And implicitly everything that builds upon it. However, maybe we can get more directly at the um, things like chemistry and biology, and we'll talk about that later. Now, if we look at the first four alphabets, and using the algebraic version that we have of them, we see that these are specific um, algebras in, in mathematics. And there are a specific set of algebras, they are what we call the division algebras. Real complex quaternion vector. Or, or, or manifestations of things similar to the division alphabets. And if we look at the way physics is structured, then it's been a long-term belief of mine, um, largely borne out by things that I've found since, that there are only four fundamental ways of looking at the physical world. Only four fundamental things through which we picture nature as we see it. We can call them mass, time, charge, and space. Mass, of course, including energy. Charge, including three different types for electric, strong, and weak. And this, is, this here explains why we got three different types of charge, because this here is a quaternion, and this is a structure that is three-dimensional. <coughs> You have I and you have J, and therefore you also have K, the third dimension. So charge is a three-dimensional structure like space. And in, uh, in relativity theory, we realize that time is an imaginary number, and this is complex algebra being used to represent time. 
So the first four alphabets <coughs> appear to have the characteristics <coughs> associated with the four physical parameters from which we can derive everything else, force, uh, momentum, angular momentum, and all those things. Suggesting that the successive emergence, that these are kind of successive pictures of the universe, successive separate pictures of the universe. So we have a mass picture, we have a time picture, we have a charge picture, and we have a space picture. And if we got all those separate ones, then we can, um, if we combine them, we will find that mathematically those four algebras, mathematically combined, produce what we might call a double Clifford algebra, which, as I mentioned before, is the sixth stage in the rewrite structure, uh, which is the point of repetition, the point at which you get a repeating cycle. So you've got the kind of repeating unit, it's kind of the unit cell of this, as it were. Physics requires one unit cell of this. And we, can, we will also show that it's equivalent to a double three-dimensional space. So the physical particles actually require this algebra. Uh, when we write the Dirac equation, the fundamental quantum mechanical equation which applies to all fundamental physical particles, then we find that this is precisely the algebra that it uses. So we've got two reasons for being interested in this physically. We've got mass, time, charge and space, the four fundamental parameters. Stick all their algebras together and we get the algebra of the Dirac equation. But we also get the, the fundamental unit of the rewrite structure that we've created before it begins to repeat. <coughs> so, the fundamental object of physics requires those four algebras. This combination looks like this. <coughs> I'll do it more understandably in a minute. Um, what happens if we multiply all this out and get every single unit of this algebra that can possibly exist, we find there are 64 units. It's what we call a 64-part algebra. This double three-dimensional space algebra requires 64 types of units. And those are there. The blue ones are vector algebras, the red ones are quaternion algebras, and the, these are ordinary complex algebras. So the Dirac equation requires exactly this algebra of 64 units. Uh, and we, there's all kinds of things that we can describe it as, but it's equivalent to the algebra of the sixth al alphabet. If I, uh, the repeating structure, this algebra is that algebra, the 64 elements. And that's a very important number to remember, 64. So this is the first level at which the process of conjugation, complexification, and dimensionalization are successively introduced and then can be all incorporated into a repetitive sequence. And it's like something we've already seen. We've already seen how you can have commutative and anti-commutative. If you take A, B as anti-commutative, then the anti-commutative with A is B and A, B and nothing else. So it's like a boxing off of that little cycle. This is like a boxing off of this little cycle. In commutativity, that continues to infinity. You can have infinite dimensions uh, at the commutative, but you can only have three that are anti-commutative in the way that we've described. In closing, this is the reason why we can uh, introduce numbers, because we've got closed cycles. So this, when fully worked out, generates a total of 64 units. And we could start those 64 if we multiplied all these eight out. This is, so we've got units of mass, the units of charge, the units of space, and the units of time. And if we multiplied all those out, we'd get the 64. And that would be what we call the group of all the 64. However, it's possible to get those using fewer units. If we look at the table of units there, we could choose the, the, the eight that we've chosen from that table, or we could choose five 
from that table. And that five would look like something like this. So this, this, the fewest units you can use to generate all 64 is this five. You can generate them from these eight, but this is fewer. And nature will always go for what's fewer. And so in a sense, this is the fundamental, even though it's not more fundamental than that uh, at the basis, it's more fundamental than that in the sense that there are only five of those in the rate of those. And nature does choose those five, or some five that are exactly equivalent to them. Because those five turn out to be equivalent to the energy, momentum, and rest mass of a particle. And the E, P, and M are just scalar values, they're just numbers that they don't change the structure. So uh, there's not something new added by putting these symbols there. All we're doing is saying that this is the way physics determines it. And we happen to call that one energy, but its properties are determined by that. We can call that momentum and call that mass. So the remarkable thing is that if we choose to take that those five to represent a fundamental physical unit, we find that we can immediately solve the problem of indefinite extension. I think this answers your earlier question uh, when we come to it. This is because those five, remember that this is a three-dimensional quantity, that's why it's five. When multiplied by itself, turns out to be zero. You get Einstein's energy momentum equation. E squared minus P squared minus M squared equals zero. It's the relativistic and quantum mechanical conservation of energy and momentum. And if this incorporates all the alphabet needed to create a, a, a repetitive sequence, if we seek to create the next L alphabet by squaring as in effect we do, we find it's automatically zero. So zeroing all the higher alphabets incorporated. So we found a special structure within our infinite structure which can be used as a repeating structure. As, as I say, a kind of unit cell of the, of the process. But we can def define the world through an indefinite succession of such units. I can make it quantum mechanical by applying conservation and non-conservation. I've not talked about that, but that's fundamental to what we were talking about. This now becomes the Dirac equation. That's the same as this, but, but um, represented in a different way. So that now becomes the Dirac equation. So we've generated the fundamental quantum mechanical equation simply by algebra. The algebra that we've derived from the, the rewrite structure. So the bracket or op objects, these things here can represent operator, wave function, or they can represent ordinary classical quantities. And this thing is a square root of zero. Let's look at this thing here. It's a square root of zero. And in a sense, this is connecting to the rest of the universe. And by the way, these things don't, this is a free particle, but it doesn't have to be free. These can contain any. This E can represent a whole multitude of things with various potentials or field terms. And the same for the P. If we create a nilpotent fermion, a fundamental particle that's nilpotent, that squares itself to zero, then what you're doing, if the universe is a total zero, you're automatically saying that that fermion plus the rest of the universe is zero. So the rest of the universe is a negative version of this structure to maintain totality zero. And it also squares itself to zero as well. So it multiplies and adds up to zero. The particle and the rest of the universe which is needed to create that particle add up to zero and multiply to zero. And this is a remarkable thing because it makes quantum mechanics almost easy. If you write down quantum mechanics in this form, you can solve many problems very easily. For example, if you, I know students spend about eight weeks solving the hydrogen atom using the Schrodinger equation. However, if you use this, you can do it in six lines. 
and more accurately because it's relativistic. It makes relativistic quantum mechanics easier than ordinary non-relativistic quantum mechanics. And it makes quantum field theory much easier. It's, it, you can get solutions to things you cannot normally get, like the strong and weak interactions. You get analytic solutions of them. Never been done before except by this method. So it also helps you to understand what quantum mechanics and the power exclusion and all that sort of thing is all about. So the special nature of this term, this first term we have in regard to self-organization, comes if we treat reality as a zero totality. If we can imagine creating the object out of absolutely nothing, then you're left with what you might consider a hole in nothing. So you pluck the fermion particle in all its state, whatever it is, out of nothing, and you're left a universe which is the whole in nothing left by that particle. So the rest of the universe has to be so structured as to make that pos particle possible and to create a zero totality. This is what we vaguely term as vacuum. That's what we mean by vacuum. Vacuum isn't nothing, it's a whole in nothing. So it's a whole multitude of things. It's the whole universe we need so that that particle can exist in its state. It's a kind of mirror image. So the two uh, things we can do is combine them by addition, which is what we call um, superposition, or we can combine them by combination, which is like that. Now, if you had two particles exactly the same, and you worked out their combination state, it will be zero. Multiply to, if you multiply this by itself to zero, no two fermions can have the same wave function. Pauli exclusion. The origin of the whole of chemistry, the whole of biology, and everything else follows from the Pauli exclusion principle. The Pauli exclusion principle is obvious if this is the square root of zero. Because multiplying by another particle identical itself will give you zero. I think I've already explained this. Uh, the nilpotent condition is achieved in an infinite number of ways, each of which is unique. It has to be unique. They all have to be unique. And it's not just quantum physics that does it. It's all systems at high levels. Now this is an important thing. Um, if you look, another way to look at the problem is to say it's an interaction between two spaces. And this is one thing that will help us to connect us to biology and other areas. We've got two spaces. We've got space as we know it, which is the thing we use for measurement and everything. And remember that space is the only thing we can measure. We can't identify anything else except space by measurement. Nothing else can be measured directly. Everything is a pointer moving across a scale or something equivalent. Only space can be measured. So this is the thing that we can measure. The rest of our understanding has to come from these parameters, none of which can be directly measured. But mathematically, if you bundle this lot together, if you multiply that times all that, I get the equivalent of another space. The equivalent of, mathematically equivalent. It isn't a space in the physical sense, but it's mathematically a space. But it's all di different bits and pieces, so we can't actually observe it. And it, it. We can think of it as a kind of anti-space. We now know that particles are actually just points, but there's no way for mathematics to create a point in space. It just doesn't exist. The only way we can create a point in space is if it's a place where we go into another space, a kind of crossover point into another space, and the totality being zero. So this is a kind of, these create a kind of anti-space, and that's what makes the nil point of position and the point point particle singularity possible. But we needn't just do it for physics, we can do it for any defined system, we can do it for other parts of physics, we can do it for chemistry, we can do it for biology. And this repeats itself, this structure. I think here we can just do a, a quick explanation of the difference of why but, but Peter was saying about how mathematics and physics emerge from the same thing, they're not separate. There's no reason 
there wouldn't be any reason for mathematics to use physics unless they did. So mathematics it can, be, can be seen as an emergent property of an ongoing rewrite process, no starting point, and endlessly reconstructed. It, you take, use the whole rewrite structure to describe it serial. And it's a kind of restricted part of nature which we do the whole rewrite structure to describe it. That gives us our syntactical processing. Now, physics uses a re restricted part of the Iraq structure, repeated and repeated and repeated, to describe in parallel the whole of the universe at once. So that's how they kind of diverge, but are connected. We're using the, the structure in slightly different ways. I think we've mentioned this already. The creation and it is needs a simultaneous application of a proofreading conserve operation, which makes it possible to, uh, to show that the new symbol isn't an anomaly. And each new nil positive state x is compatible, but different from all the previous ones. So that the fermion Dirac states x, which each is unique, unique and conform to the exclusion principle, predicate all the semantic truths and it's a non-trivial emergent Fermian cosmology that we would get from it. <coughs> and as we're saying, the quantum field theory trace will always be a zero totality, even though each Fermian is non-zero and non-trivial. It's a non-trivial square root of zero. And irreversibly emergent, because each must be different from all that preceded it. Because we're not saying that this can be repeated in time, Nothing can be repeated, not even the time. Nothing can be repeated. It has to be a um, unique birth ordering. We get self-similarity at all scales, and we will show that the other things follow the same logic. So what we're going to say is that a nil potent relationship a, with the, the rest of the universe, a mirror image of our system, can be postulated for the universe in any self organizing system. And we can do that through the energy and momentum because we know that that works anyway for uh, any system. So the universal connection means the universal computational rewrite meta language, if you like to call it, which is L, I think Peter mentioned that earlier overcomes the problem of a lack of semantic information. Because if you've got digital logic, you're not actually looking at the whole universe. Here you are. You can only look at the whole universe. Each firm in each system determines the rest of the universe as well. And because it goes to infinity and it's entirely tractable, as we will show, it entirely evolves the whole halting problem. <coughs> Yet, it's not as though it isn't like the Turing process, it's very similar. It's a generalization using a new, uh, broader concept. So, I don't want to go into too much detail about this, but we'll talk about this a bit later. We're saying that all these things here a semantic productions and a rewrite language syntax realized by the algebraic operations of the mathematical group ensures the finiteness of the quantum field theory solution. But I'll not go into that detail. So it incorporates the concept of quantum probability in the form of the complete symmetry Galois permutation group. We'll talk about that in a minute. The mathematical concept of group and its Lie calculus of derivatives is utterly central the quantum physics. Because applying the correct syntax will always re result in normalization or convergence. And this is because all groups have a unit element and all elements have an inverse. So our, uh, any group structure we have will have an inverse. So if we want to express our rewrite structure in a ge more general sense, find that rather than using a finite alphabet symbols, it uses an infinite alphabet based on the concept of group and vial who Peter mentioned earlier. Its universe of algebraic solutions has an inverse and a group element. The group here is the 
is the nil potent group. That bracket in object is a group object. It's a nil potent group. And it includes all the um, processes that we will need to make computation tractable. And this is another thing mentioned by Peter. All members or elements of the automisms, they all become members or elements of the automorphisms of the complete Galois group of permutations. Because you can represent any group as a permutation group, ultimately. And so we can represent our group, our nilpotent group, and, uh, as a member, as, as, a, as a permutation group. If we take the symbols of the alphabet to represent abstract groups rather than number, as their syntax allows the, the, the language to, def, to redefine self-organization and a fully normalized quantum field theory in a very simple way, as automorphic. So we've, we've mentioned that. And Conway has shown that these automorphisms have an optimal unique process of birth ordering in the form of a unique birth order automorphism. So we get the unique birth ordering again, and this will be very important to us later. So this is the self-organized generation of the new meta language itself, uh, with an optimal sequence of symbols representing its mathematical universe of algebraic solutions. Okay. Uh, and again, we get probability automatically through the concept of permutation, without even referring to probability theory. with many uh, consequences. So the groups, the, including the Goldberg group, emerge naturally from the rewrite structure because the nilpotent structure is a fundamental lead group. And the, Fermi, the important thing is that the permutation group is computable and defines probability in quantum mechanics. So we don't need statistics for it. The, the computation is where we get our statistics. And as I've mentioned already, all self-organization is organized through a nilpotent structure in which every system has its mirror image in the rest of the universe and so immediately generates an inverse. That's the inverse of the, of the, of the groups. So we can expect, it, it's because we're connecting with the rest of the universe all the time that self-organization is true. We call it self-organization but it's really universal organization because each system organizes itself and it organizes the rest of the universe and vice versa. If you like, we create the system by reverse engineering from the rest of the universe. So if we've got the rest of the universe, we can create a system by reverse engineering it from it. So any system is like a group element with the rest of the universe as its inverse. So that, and when you get any change, it will be another element in the same Lie group. And I think we'll I'll leave that for the moment. I just mentioned down there we had success because we predicted the relevance of biological of berry phase. I don't, I'll talk about that at the interval if anybody wants to in biological context. We guess that will be true, and then we saw a description of a result involving the human cortex in which it was obvious to us that the very phase was involved. Yeah. Well, it was an, uh, an interesting place, that paper. Yeah. Why? I equals... Uh, yeah. Uh, Something or other. The big pi equals the visual. Part. Yeah, because the, because the pi turned out in it, it, it was obvious it must be very phase, as we predicted. I just want to mention a little bit about entropy. So entropy is an obvious consequence of this. Each alphabet includes the previous one, it's intrinsically irreversible. You can't reverse it if you always include the previous alphabet. Every new alphabet is always an extension to the last. We get a very simple definition of entropy. If you bifurcate, bifurcate at every new creation, you get two to the end components at the end stage. Now the standard definition of entropy, Boltzmann's definition, S equals K log W, the K is only there because we've historically separated temperature and heat. So we don't need the K, uh, we only need the log W. 
It's just a number. We can re redefine entropy as, as the number n, the order of the alphabet from any, any given beginning. Then the entropy measure just becomes s equals k n log 2. We get rid of the k and we get uh, n logarithm 2. Logarithm 2 is just a, a factor which we can eliminate. So in effect, our entropy is simply the order of our rewrite structure. The number of equally probable microstates at the end stage is 2 to the n. And so this gives us an idea of increasing complexification disorder. And it doesn't matter what kind of system, it always works for that. Well, we can use the increase in entropy that we always observe as evidence that the rewrite system is actually bifurcating. And the rate of entropy increase is a measure of bifurcation, so providing a standard clock, if you like. Uh, this would accord with Shannon's view of 948 that at least K2 log 2 must be dissipated per bit of information. Now self-organization allows us to take the loss, in fact, as a measure, not simply of the loss, but of the information, which enables the self-organization to proceed. And so we can treat the self-organization if it's a complete binary chain or one measure. And at some scale, the measure of information transfer and entropy is increasing determined by the level of the alphabet reached. So that's what we're talking about. I'll say more about temperature, I'll leave that for another time. Translations from local to non-local to local effects cause time asymmetry because the local requires asymmetric time-like and cosmic. Yet the non-local doesn't require time asymmetry, it's a standard thing of quantum mechanics, but local does. <coughs> but you can't have a local, a non-local process without a local one. And so there's always a, a time component. And I think this is observability means that we're talking about an event in the present. The future is part of that vacuum state, that minus our state, that negative part of our state. The future is all, all in the vacuum. If we refer to the bifurcation process, we can see that the rate at which uh, it happens is proportional to the free energy involved. And the higher the energy, the higher the rate of bifurcation. Now, if you've got something near chaotic, it will be highly nonlinear, highly connective, and so it would bifurcate rapidly. And so that's why these systems generate a large measure of entropy, especially living systems. If, if you've got a system leading to chaos, growth in an animal population, there comes a point when the, the growth rate increases above a certain value. And the equation produces a bifurcation between two possible outcomes. If you keep doing that, uh, you get bifurcations of each bifurcation. And that's where the Feigenbaum number comes in. By the way, I don't know of any explanation of this particular number. It would be interesting if anybody could find one. So this can be seen as a characteristic extension of the alphabet by the creation of a new one. It's exactly the same as we've got in our rewrite structure. Yeah, we mentioned this already. Uh, yeah, that's chaos. So a system operating near chaos will have a high efficiency in transferring free energy and be subject to rapid development. This is what life is. Life object. What, uh, happens very near to chaos. It's always at the edge of chaos. And that's because life, living systems, are very highly connected, non-linear things. I think I'm not going to put too much detail on, on this. Yeah, this is something else that you, because you want zero, every system tries to kind of zero itself. It kind of tries to connect with as much of it as it can of that uni universe. 
Now, of course, that usually only happens locally when you get a sort of combination, but that combination doesn't entirely satisfy it. So it tries to make another combination, and another combination, and another. So you get a hydrogen atom, then tries to build itself into a molecule, and then the molecule tries to, to build itself up into a system, and so forth. You, it's, it's a continual attempt for any isolated system to try to zero itself with the rest of the universe. And the, and the tendency is always in the direction of maximum entropy. Okay, that's what I want to do on the physics side of it. Um, if there's any quick questions, I could possibly answer them now. Because I'm now going to do Vanessa's, not Vanessa's presentation, but the presentation of the biological work that we did with Vanessa, which is different. Type of thing. Okay, how are we doing? Okay, so we apparently don't have an interval, so I'm just going to carry on. But this, this is, this is I, I'm co-author of this, but I wasn't going to present it, so you wouldn't have just had to listen to me all the time. However, I'm afraid you have to because Vanessa can't come. So I know we've got biologists in the audience, and so I hope they're interested in this concept. So, our nilpotent function operates in such a way that the system becomes a mirror image of its environment. And the, the change is mutual and it's all specific. And it's not quantum physics or even physics, it's anything will do this. And this is how we can tell that we have a holistic way of looking at things. We've got the characteristic, characteristic mathematical patterns that we find in physics also occur in biology and other areas. And it seems, to, especially the genetic code, and it seems that it must be the same information system forcing this similarity. And these are the characteristic patterns that we've noticed in all these areas. Double three-dimensionality, I've already mentioned that. Two vector spaces, that's the same as, as the double three-dimensionality, which creates a singularity or a boundary. Uh, you, you get double helical structure. When you get it out in physics, well, what's half spin is double helical structure. Five-fold broken symmetry. I didn't discuss this in detail, but if you put two lots of three-dimensionality together, you get a broken symmetry. I'll explain that later. Fibonacci numbers, which that they come from having a five-fold symmetry. The uniqueness of objects in birth ordering, irreversibility. There's always a harmonic oscillator aspect of the structure. The, the electron, any fermion, is a harmonic oscillator. It oscillates with the vacuum in and out, called zeta bovenum. And so does the, the genetic structure. A tendency for aggregation, that, I just mentioned that at the end of the last presentation. Single-handedness or chirality, classic for electrons, also for uh, biological uh, structures. Characteristic appearance of several key numbers. And the reason why we get those relative to platonic solids is that platonic solids are a characteristic dual space structure. Because you can turn one inside out and get the other structure. It's like they exist in two spaces at once. And various groups like E8, which come from the octonium symmetries, or the symmetries of um, division algebras. And amazingly, the key numbers are very, very simple. There's just two key numbers, two and three. And two is duality, and three is anti-commutativity. They come up everywhere. This is because we sum something to zero, and this is because of that necessity for anti-commutivity. We get fives, but they're not pure symmetries. They're, when you stick things together, you get fives, and that's a characteristic of a broken symmetry. And we get this in all geometries up to dimension eight, and then Lie groups up to E8, which is the highest one you can get from the uh, basic algebras. Let me just put that, it would be too confusing to read all that, but this is a table of particles. Essentially, that lists all the, all the known 
fermion and boson, fundamental boson states. And the quarks on the left, leptons, the next column, bosons, the gauge bosons, not ordinary bosons, but gauge bosons. And that's the quarks plus leptons give you fermions, bosons. And then the total, this, this is spin, isospin, antiparticle, vacuum, which generation. So that's just fundamental particles. But if you look over that table of numbers, you'll see they're everywhere else that's important. Exactly the same numbers. If you look at platonic solids in any dimension, up to eight at least, you will see all the numbers and vertices and faces and all that come in there. If you look at kissing numbers, so I'm packing things together, you'll see they're all in there. If you look at the Lie groups up to E8, you'll see all the numbers are in there. 240 is, is the number of root vectors in E8. So in other words, all these incredible symmetries are based just on 2 and 3. And we find that we can do this either geometrically or algebraically because both are based on double spaces with the one being reciprocal of the other. So we will often follow the geometrical one here, but we'll also do the algebraic one. So I've done algebraic ones for physics, but, but I could also do geometrical ones for physics, which I have done. And we can do both for the, the biology as well. Now, the thing is that biology is entirely concerned with self-organizing systems interacting with environments, exactly what we want to look at, exactly what we're talking about. If we talk about the process of replication, transcription, translation, and all that, this is a classic example of a system acting with a mirror image environment. That's what DNA does. It's got a mirror image of itself that it interacts with in one form or another. RNA is what? Well. But the hidden three-dimensional structure determining the behavior of the one we observe. And if we look at it in detail, we see that it follows the similar pattern to the self-organization of the fermion and the vacuum in quantum mechanics. When I say five-fold broken symmetry, remember that energy, momentum, and mass, that five. All the, all the terms in it were different. They weren't a perfect symmetry of five. They were all <coughs> different terms, which is a broken symmetry. And the fivefold broken symmetry of the nil potent structure in physics can be seen to be matched by a broken fivefold, and we can represent it um, geometrically as an icosy dodecahedral symmetry in DNA. If you look along the axis of DNA, you see it's a fivefold symmetry. And all the special characteristics of DNA, the spiral and all that, comes from the fivefold symmetry of the axis. The pattern of physical interactions is a counterpart in the process of translation and transcription. So it's combining partners, then splitting up, combining with new partners, and so on. And that's what DNA does, that's what particles do. And we can do either geometrical or algebraic. This is the slide that Peter showed before. And we can see just by a superficial look that we have similarity between all these, um, these things. We get one-handedness in the biology, we get one-handedness in the physics. We get Van der Waals force or other forces, hydrogen bonding, that sort of thing, um, which cause oscillation in the structure. We get unlike uh, opposites attracting and combining and then splitting apart. And we've got 64 elements of the algebra, and we've got 64 codons, which we can represent by the same algebra, which I'll show later. And we've got four basic structures in the biology, and we've got four in the physics. And they seem to uh, occupy the same area in the information system. So this is and what we do with DNA to protein. This is standard um, DNA four bases, double strand, helix, sense and antisense, RNAs, one sense, uh, proteins encoded with messenger RNA by triplet codons translated into amino acids. There are 64 possible triplet codons that can be made. 
nature only uses 20 amino acids. So one of the things that we did do, we started with, we could represent the four premises of physics by tetrahedron, because you can, it's a simple representation, there are many others, you can represent it as a cubical structure, you can represent it as a, a, a circular structure, there are various ways of doing it, but if you can represent them by tetrahedron, and you can represent the properties as faces, and the, the uh, sorry, the, the, not the properties, the parameters as faces or edges, and the uh, properties uh, by the lines and things like that. So DNA made of four bases, and the same you can do the same with the uh, DNA. You can do the four bases on the base on the, on the tetrahedron, and you can derive 64 triplet codons by building up tetrahedra. And I will show you how that is the same structure as what we've done in our rewrite structure. Go past this quickly so I can show this here. So we just build up order four, we, we just double the structure at each stage, and we can build up the higher um, five dimensional things we need by, by various um, smaller structures um, tetrahedra, star tetrahedra, and so forth. And we can just build it up slowly as you can see. And th this is like elements on the rewrite structure we can put down these in an algebraic sense as well. And we can do it right all the way up to this where you get a helix formation. And we can represent translation and transcription by doing this. And we can see that there's a broken symmetry here. Um, in the structure, and that's because we end up with a fivefold structure. This is very similar to what happens in the physics because we have eight elements, and we, put, we take three away and put them on like that, on those five, and that gives us a broken structure. And we're doing very similar in the biology. And eventually we get this kind of thing, this is the, looking along the axis of the DNA, we get this. We get pentagonal disks, you get 10 of them, and the 10, there's always a little bit of angle left over, and that forces it into a spiral structure going upwards. And then we can put these on top of a scatter graph of DNA, and we can put our geometrical structures on top of those like that. Now I want to show that I can do this, the, the codons algebraically and uh, the way you do it is by, the, these are arbitrary, but these I can select. The thing is that the three bases in, in a codon don't occupy the same function, so we can represent them by a different algebra. So if I represent the first set of codons by a vector algebra, the second set of codons by a quaternion algebra, and the third by a complex algebra. That will give us all 64 elements, and we will see how we build up the codons that naturally group together to produce the same amino acids. So there, there's group one there. And group two. And group three. In group four. And we see how we can group together. All those groups only have the, the same structures together. These groups are based on the middle codon. There's other ways of doing it, but you can see how you can represent all of these uniquely. And you get some beautiful symmetric patterns in it. So we can see the pattern's perf almost perfect. If you look at group three and group four, it's absolutely perfect. And if we look at group two, the only, the only thing that looks different is having the serine and arginine. I think there's one of those is slightly enormous, but not much. And that's only because we're looking at one, one species. If we looked at another species, it wouldn't be the same. 
And it, it does seem that they become mixed at some stage in biological evolution. And by the way, one could use this as a, as a kind of uh, way of looking at phylogeny and so on. And we find interesting things like this, the code for tryptophan. Where's tryptophan? Yeah. That, that could be a stock code on in a different species. Tryptophan isn't used in some species, is that correct? The biologist knows. So it could be a stock code on in another species. And so you see how that crosses over into that. So the, the biological, uh, the algebra suggests how, they, how we can get these crossovers. I can represent these using an icosi dodecahedron. So exactly the same algebra. This is the algebra now. And the, if you put all this bit, bit together, you will get an icosi dodecahedron. So our icosi dodecahedron can be represented by the algebra. There's more than one way to do this, but if, if we, um, I think we can see how these, these will be connected. It's, it's hard to do it on a flat, but I could do it better if I had a, a, an actual structure. I could show how to do it. Um, yeah. And we can actually develop a, a nilpotent structure. Even. Let me see. I'll, I'll show it in a moment. One of the significant aspects is that the algebraic units of the three pentagons in each combined with those of the two outer triangles are lost to form the base of the nil portion structure, exactly as we get here. And by the way, let me show you what this broken symmetry is now. You see the three I's, J, and K, the blue ones, they're all connected to the same object, this red eye. So they retain their symmetry. However, the red ones, the other three dimensionality, has broken up because that K is, is connected to that. This I is connected to something totally different. And J it is connected to just a scalar quantity. And so if you put two three-dimensionalities together in this way, you always get the broken symmetry. And if I did this in terms of the charges, I would explain why we get SU2 for that one because of that, SU3 for this one because of this, and U1 for that one because of that. And so I'd explain the structure of the standard model, but that's for another time. So we can have a set of nilpotent units. It appears that we have the means by which a self-organizing system can connect to its environment. This nilpotency, the squaring to zero, one is the object, one is the environment, this negative version. And this is the nilpotent version of it. You can take those objects and the five will create a null potent. Okay, and that's all I'm going to do on this because um, we haven't got time for anything else. So, thank you. I'm sorry, but you haven't finished with me yet. I'm sorry about this. That shouldn't have been me, so I hope you take that into account. This should have been me. And this is something that worked with Peter on the general principles. I'll, I'll try to be quick so you don't get tired of hearing me. Peter, so before you go on, perhaps just briefly because, um, as you said, that's maybe someone else's material, not as much as yours. Can you explain how what you just presented goes beyond essentially kind of complex pattern spotting? Because you, you showed or, or, or briefly mentioned on one slide that that only applies to one species. Oh no, that um, was just that particular layout, but, but the but species are very it, similar. So much of it's similar, much of it isn't. But um, I get the feeling that for lots of disciplines, lots of numbers, you know, you, you, you could quite easily say 20 forces, 20 something else's, oh, whatever field that might be. And, and I think... Um, to me, there's a difference between finding similarities and then using the universal real language to, to suggest how they may 
or why they may be similar, than actually explaining the genesis of both systems and saying this is why our language says both these systems have arisen. We have discussed that. We have discussed that, but I didn't have time to talk about it. We, we, we have discussed the processes of transcription and translation, the processes, not just the similarities in the patterns, but the actual processes, how the processes can be explained as the environment connecting with the, with the object. So, I mean, if there is a thing which connects with its environment, DNA, because it grabs all its partners from whatever environment it has, and reconstructs itself by using its environment. I think it must be the process that's key to me, because um, from my perspective, there's nothing special about DNA. Um, 20 amino acids, to me, is a coincidence. It's 20 in some species. Not that maybe. Numbers, as with four bases. As, as with lots of these similarities, I think that, that the nature of the similarity perhaps doesn't centre around the, the numbers or the symmetry. It's, or it's, the, it's the process. We, 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 those slides I showed with the Georgia, they were a process. They weren't just pattern. We were actually showing how the process happens. Okay. And I think uh, it's very difficult to deny that there's something fundamental if you see a process happen. So I think that's how I would answer that. Fine, thank you. And in any case, we, there's a lot more similarities than, than just those numbers. There's the similarity in what they do. Mm. You know, the, the, the zitter bevegung, as it were, the jittering of the strands and all that. The, the uh, chirality of it. The, um, the helical structure. You know, emerging. All that kind of thing seems to be part of a process. And if you look at it as a geometric process as well as an algebraic one, you see that if you're putting two spaces together in some peculiar way, then you always get this kind of structure. And that seems to be what's going on. It seems to be two spaces. That's why I emphasized that earlier. If, if you break it down to its simplest level, you get two spaces interacting. I think you, you know, it's impossible to deny that there's two spaces somewhere. But there's a lot more to it than I could actually describe today. Well, there is a, it is a process that we were talking about. And I think that we could actually make um, suggestions about uh, biological things as a result of this process. That's, but you can't deny it's very suggestive, at the very least. And it's not just. Coincidences are not that, that common. In any case, you're talking about an environment and you're talking about a system and environment. And I think it's a classic case of it. Yeah. So let's try and do this last bit of the presentation. Um, so the rewrite structure predicts a staircase of structures and nil potents at one level become units of the next. One of the things that mattered to us particularly was the number five appearing, because five is always the signal for a broken symmetry. And you, and you could do it five going downwards and five going upwards. And I did that with particle structures. I showed how you had each particle structure was a five, but then it, 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 then it involved in another five in, 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 the, in that bigger group. And we found the same with, with DNA, that you could go five downwards and five upwards. Well, I think the Fermi is the perfect self-organizing system. Everything constructed from fermions can be described in the same quantum mechanics and so are also self-organizing. A self-similar order can be predicted at high levels, even though you may lose coherence. You may not be able to maintain the same structure coherently upwards, but then a new self-similarity will emerge at a higher level. And uh, for example, let's just, th th these may be coincidence or may not. These people showed that link chains of magnetic atoms of cobalt transform under a magnetic field to an aligned spin into a critical quantum state, which is a quantum version of a fractal pattern with things, uh, resonances in the golden ratio. Another important thing is that this is 
This is really an expression of conservation of angular momentum. Either the system or the system connected with the environment. And large scale systems, galaxies for example, uh, clearly observe angular momentum in this way and can be modelled by expressions like this. Uh, this, is a, this is something very interesting. Astronomers discovered an unusual helix shaped nebula near the centre of the Milky Way. Um, looked like the classic image of a DNA molecule. Uh, the nebula formed because it's so close to the massive massive black hole at the heart of the Milky Way, which is a very powerful magnetic field. Powerful enough to reach out to this incredible list and twist up this gas cloud with its field lines. And another group of people have demonstrated that particles in the plasma can undergo self-organization uh, as electronic charges become and the plasma become results in microscopic strands of solid particles that are twisted to corkscrew shapes or helical structure resembling the DNA. Uh, these helical strands are themselves electrically charged and are attracted to each other. Divide into two, form two copies of the original structure and interact and induce charge from the neighbours. Yeah. They could also evolve in a sort of way similar to biological. Another thing is, was mentioned by Peter was quantum holography. And what I want to mention here is the holographic principle, which is, which is thought to be a general organising principle in nature. And the holographic principle effectively says all the information about the system is on the bounding area. Now that area can be inter interpreted as space times space or space times time. It can also be interpreted as energy and momentum. Because that's the time and that's the space. And if you've got IK and E and IP, then the J app is an automatic consequence, so it's not new information. So these two alone give you all the information about the system. So they're equivalent to a time and single dimension in space as we represent them that way as uh, differentials. And they, so these, you can say that this, if the system has this structure, then it, you, you are coding the entire information in the equivalent of a bounding area. It can be considered as a characteristic signature of a nil positive self-organizing system. And if you talk about quantum holography, as Peter did, then you talk about the nil positive structure accommodates phase, amplitude, and reference phase. You can represent this as quantum holography. It's quantum, and you can represent it as quantum holography. And you only need two terms because the third is always redundant. This is different from classical holography because it's not degenerate. So we may invoke the uniqueness of the nil positive condition as the source of the uniqueness of the semantic logic. What we're trying to get at all the time is that there's something semantic. Semantic means nature is forcing us to do this in some fundamental way. And we're connected with the whole of nature if we can do it this way. There's one universal condition at any instant can be described as a unique birth ordering. Uh, we have this uh, idea of order emerging from chaos. The universal rewrite system shows that quantum chaos leads directly to nil potence. This is the quantum criterion for the required universal fractal behavior. So what we need for a repeating unit is a double vector space. And then these two three-dimensional algebras can be related to the three-dimensional Heisenberg Lie group and its nil potent the algebra, the dual inverses, as we talked about earlier. This is what makes quantum holography possible, that quantum holography that Peter showed examples of in his earlier talk. This is the, the magnetic resonance imaging where Walter Schenk has done a systematic theorizing on this. So he's shown how it applies the quantum control of these systems. And we get the signal paths in the human brain, um, which he showed that picture of that, and there are many other pictures similar to that. 
Now, perhaps also, we might guess that the human brain is organized according to this natural logic. In other words, that there's some way in which the human brain has got used to it, has developed from its environment, and therefore uh, learned to interact with its environment in a way that a, a restricted logical structure couldn't. Um, Giuseppe Vitiello has uh, proposed a quantum field model. Um, describes the brain thermodynamically as a dissipator system leading to, leading to a quantum field approach um, based on the positive energy output by the brain mirroring the negative en energy output by the environment. So in other words, that's a classic case of the, of the system and the environment um, producing this nilpotent balance. A nilpotent wave function would give the exact mathematical structure modeling this process as one is the negative of the other. And also we can say that, and this is something that uh, Charles is interested in here, uh, brains can keep multiplying their connections. Uh, well, this is what would happen in the rewrite structure. If you can keep multiplying your connections, keep bifurcating, then you can, you, you could, this, is what, this would make the brain different from a computer. Peter, go back one. Um, the, uh, you'll send us here the need to describe the brain thermodynamically. Do you explain that, that uh, sentence again, would you? Yeah, what he says is the brain is dissipative thermodynamically. In other words, you're, you're putting energy out to the environment. Um, the output of the brain, positive energy by the brain, the input, but, the, but that's, that's equivalent to negative energy um, from the environment. If, if you flow in one way because it's dissipative, then in other words, it's uh, the environment's doing the opposite because that energy's got to go somewhere. And it, it, if we can model that because we've got plus E here and minus E there. Thank you. Uh, Peter, are you actually saying that the left and right hemispheres of the brain? are actually um, generating energy out. I'm not saying that, just simply yeah. with yellow. Yeah, but is, is that what you mean? That I think that's what he means, yes. Yeah, so you... Do you have anything to say on that, Peter? You, um, yeah. you create a zero point in the distance with it. Yeah, well, you, you know, your concept of zero point is very much this more potent thing. Yeah. yeah. You asked me about that at the interval, mm -hmm. and I said that I would discuss it, and that's... What we, we would consider the nil potent condition to be this, that zero point that you're talking about. Yeah, but that's, that's the zero point of the connection of the left and right brain. Well, it could be. Yeah. Yeah, it could, it could be that as well. Yeah. Yes. There's no reason why it can't be. Right. Okay. Well, you might even be able to test that position with the uh, MRI. Could well be. Keith, well accepted, isn't it, that the brain generates energy? Mm -hmm. Yes, but he was modeling it as a quantum field process. Which fits with, he wasn't saying it was new, but what he was saying is the quantum field process. And we say immediately how yeah, we can do that with the null potent structure, because that's what we do. The environment and the object add up to zero. Yeah, Peter, and this is interesting because the observed processing mechanism of the brain does appear to have a bifurcating dynamical system. I've got reference here to. Is you came in 2003. I, I saw a lecture recently you know, in which this was referred to um, by a man who's a, a, a neuroscientist. Uh, this, emphasis, uh, this is in line with our emphasis that the brain does work on bifurcations. And I noticed another thing is, it, this also was in that lecture, the communication aspect of the brain function requires an address event representation, which is a unique numbering for each neuron in line with our requirement for canonical label. We got both of these from a lecture I attended in Manchester. Um, I can't remember the name of the man, but he's well known in brain He's a Manchester uh, based brain scientist. And uh, it, it just struck me that both of these were ideal. But th th this is. Um, as far as I know, accepted. Uh, well, no, I, 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 people may be able to help. I mean, there's a, a, a huge argument at the moment 
um, going on about how, in fact, it, it starts from the point of view of, of the great trigger of men. Yeah. And there are sort of two arguments. Uh, um, the one is Donald Head's argument that you know, if you've got two active neurons, they'll produce a link, which is one definition of bifurcating, if you like. Yes. Uh, and the other is that um, it's all to do with modifying assignments. Yes. But wouldn't that also be a bi bifurcation as well? Yeah. Uh, the, uh, the problem is, which is the most likely to answer the fact that I think, roughly speaking, when we're born, we've got a billion neurons. And by the time we've got to a <coughs> Sure, brain. There's something like a trillion uh, links and structures, and it's a, and in done tablets, a continuous bifurcation, which is a definition of memory. And I'm interested how that fits into uh, what you're saying there. Yeah, I'd have to look up as you, as you came, which is original paper, so I can give you the reference mm. to that. Yeah. Uh, but this also interests me. Yes because you talked about address event representation, which is basically a unique numbering for each neuron. And we need to count on It's not a unique numbering. Yeah, well, so, so you know exactly that that neuron is the one that's responding to that. And, and it won't, won't be another one, that will be that one. Um, which to me is canonical labeling, which is what we needed in our yeah, yeah. theories of brain. And we, we had the canonical labeling needed before we knew about this. Well, you, yes. can't, you can't really do computation at all unless, uh, unless the, uh, the computation can be canonical labeling. So, which means it's going to have this, it's going to have this grammar structure, yes. type, type structure. Uh, and we also know a uh, uh, what effects are also given as a uh, uh, an associative read-write uh, holographic memory filter bank uh, uh, decision function, which, uh, which from all his uh, mathematics, to in, in, indicate <coughs> the brain, the, the brains uh, that, you, you, that uh, this is the best structure for the brain that you could possibly, that, that, that yeah. you, you could possibly imagine. Because I think that might be the deciding factor in uh, ultimately in living systems that they try and do things uh, uh, as efficiently as they can. Yes, yes, yes. They, uh, they don't, we don't, don't you know, have necessarily in, uh, arrived at that, those structures here and now, but that process is perhaps on, ongoing in each of us to try, depending on what we're working on. To try and uh, reduce the, reduce things to uh, uh, something as efficient as possible. Okay. Thanks. I'll continue with something about tractability, because this is a fundamental problem in computing. Um, given any computer problem, can we express it in polynomial terms and show that the complexity over time will be as an algebraic power, or will it be a non-polynomial exponential growth? Well, we think it's the former. If, if it's P, of course, we can also design, devise an algorithm. If it's NP, then we can't. But I think nature shows that we can always devise an algorithm. Um, can we find a golden ticket decision function able to map exponential complexity back into polynomial terms? Um, Deutsch, his uh, paper mentioned earlier, um, inspired the search, and this led to our work on the universal com computational rewrite structure. And so, so we think that we can get a, a sort of grip on something, things like the standard model, the way much problem for it, chemical variables which we've not talked much about, but uh, uh, was mentioned in the connection with Vial's work and the periodic table of the elements and the DNA or RNA genetic code uh, as consequences. Then if we, at a high level, we want to explain the human organism, the nervous system, not that we want to explain it, but we want it to be explicable. 
natural language capabilities. Uh, and we're just repeating here that the system that we're using implies uh, these algebras and topological operators as well as number. Um, <coughs> and so, can we do this? Well, the framework includes D group germs commutators as a generalized function for the, of the concept of the derivative as used in calculus. Um, let's leave that. Probably. What do you want that? Yeah, we, that's a couple of references already mentioned. Now, uh, this is what we've said before. The universal computational rewrite system extends the concept to an infinite al alphabet. Um, and here we've got the normalized quantum physics, the self-organized derivation of the alphabets, emergent semantic productions. Uh, describe essentially physical conservation in the energy equation, as we, as we talked about before. So this is what we've got before. And, sorry, we're saying that the x squares to zero, so that all unique solutions are nilpotent or self-similar fractal dimension two, and constitute a single computer universal fractal attractor as Wolfram has noted. So this is a graph of economical equations showing the universal fractal attractor. Well, you can see what, where, the, uh, uh, where, where the, the center of the attractor is. And if the thing about the quantum uh, uh, thermodynamic uh, uh, Carnot engine is correct, all the, uh, all, all the changes uh, in the, the new states of matter take place, take place in, the, in, the area, in, in that area. As the, as the system evolves, it goes back into that area and then uh, a new property emerges and then things develop again uh, with, uh, with that property of the new well, One of the things that we found from the quantum mechanics is that there was, you could write, if you're writing down pile exclusion using anti anti, uh, what's it called? Anti-symmetric wave functions. The only thing that you're left with is the fact that the spin, instantaneous spin direction is different for each fermion. In other words, that instantaneous spin direction is a kind of phase, a unique phase for each fermion, and that contains all the information about it. Um, I can show that mathematically later if anyone is interested. So the power exclusion principle, which is what I'm just talking about. Modus apparatus for each unique solution. And so the infinite alphabet provides the canonical labeling of the solutions. And this would be an error free description of the computational process. Not error on our part, but no error on nature's part. So the fractal dimensionality of 2 indicates that the poly polynomial tractability of the computation. Well, well, I've got some diagrams where you show that if you, uh, if you impose a, a fractal mapping, say on a photograph, mm -hmm. on, on a computer, uh, the, the image will gradually disappear, okay, until the picture looks as if it's completely random. But if you continue the process, you continue the process, the image will reappear. So, so, so that's, that, that's, uh, that's, that's really quite interesting. Uh, yeah. And the other thing is, like the, as I said, we, I concluded that uh, the, uh, the Heisenberg uncertainty was a means of, of computing, but you can also compute with chaos. So Dan, Dan and Dubois showed that suppose you have a, a single neuron and you make the rule for it to, to change, the equation for chaos, okay? And then if you want it to uh, simulate a particular behavior, you, you tune the parameters of the equation of the chaos, and it gets there much more quickly, much, much, it gets there very, very quickly, because it gets there in, exponent, in an exponential, uh, uh, exponentially quick. Whereas if, if you just have ordinary arithmetic operations, 
it takes it can take a very long time to achieve the same object. Okay, I'll carry on with this. But to attractable computability, we've got to have uh, overcome quantum uncertainty and show the number of computational steps is polynomial, not exponential. But in addition to that, we've got to have a Hamiltonian or Lagrangian. Well, we've got that because we've got our Lagrangian operator, which is basically conservation of energy, Hamiltonian and Lagrangian. Oh, the direct operation. Yeah. And we've got the computational solution space can, can be canonically labeled. Well, if we've got an infinite alb alphabet of unique Fermi states, then we've got canonical labeling because each is unique and is unique in time as well as in space. So, I think we'll just leave that one. Since all the semantic rewrite productions turn, appertain to a single fractal computational tractor, and each concerns a, a relative geometric gauge invariant phase, and a Lie group diffeomorphism, so you can differentially exponential mapping with the differentiable inverse. And this is the important thing. If we got exponential, we can map it onto uh, a polynomial. So we can make a, a hypothesis that there can be a golden ticket. The exponential complexity can always be reduced by a sequence of inverse logarithmic ma mappings to a linear simplex of constant invariance. In the case of the human brain, that would be the perceptual invariance of the observed physical world. And Weil, in 1928, discovered that the Heisenberg uncertainty is defined in terms of the three-dimensional Heisenberg Lie group. The Lie diffeomorphism, of which concerns its own little part of the algebra. And Walter Schemp has shown in magnetic resonant imaging that this is why imaging is almost possible. And this is certainly computationally tract tractable. This is what Peter showed earlier. This is connected with Walter's work. Well, when uh, apparently when Bloch uh, started playing with these processes in the laboratory, uh, uh, he, uh, uh, he almost drove himself mad because he knew that he could actually uh, have this image or this convergent process working in the laboratory. But, uh, but when he went back to his quantum, his quantum mechanics, he concluded that it was impossible. So he, he was in two minds yeah. about you know what he should actually, uh, or, you know what what actually was happening. Schrodinger's cat. Well, this is a long, long. This is a, you know this is my century ago. Yeah. So the. Uh, Peter was showing how this is the actual means of the image producing yeah. quantum computation. And so this is the means of it. The Heisenberg's uncertainty is the means of it, not the obstacle. Yes. Yeah. But you have to do it in a you have to do it in a in a very unique way. Yeah. So uh, we'll, we don't need to go into that any further. So the brain has a canonically labeled quantum holographic pattern recognition. This is your left and right hemisphere. And um, and of language and thought. So this is an agreement with Wittgenstein's principle that there is only necessarily a one proposition for each fact that answers to it. And that the sense of the proposition can be expressed by repeating it. I'll leave that. Oh, well, this is a... Uh, this is too technical. I'll leave it. Okay. Since the... Each relative geometric gauge of very phase is arbitrary to a fixed phase, because Peter said it was arbitrary, it was just the relative phase that mattered. The rewrite system initial condition arbitrary fixed phase becomes the internal rewrite system measurement standard, against which each relatively gauge of variant phase was measured. And if you don't have that, you can't have any meaning to measurement. And also the quantum Carnot engine, uh, single temperature heat bath, uh, required for the emergence of entirely novel states of matter, which result in self-organized polar and material phase transitions. As in the course of the proposed deep rewrite quantum field thermodynamic evolution. 
So, so the golden tri ticket tractable solution proceeds by means of a universal three-dimensional geometric dynamic computer instructional replication, as well as algorithmically by universal computation. So this is in accordance with the principle of least action and the uh, Feynman sum of histories approach. And so that the human race actually becomes an, ev an agency for its evolution. Charles is right. I think I, we are part of that. We're, we're part of the whole. Um, yeah. What we what we do is uh, find, find ways of uh, pushing the evolution forward, or even backward. <laughs> so we've shown that the universal null no positive rewrite language, with infinite alpha grammatical productions is a key, at least, to a new quantum physical and tractable anticipatory computational understanding. Each and every computational tractable solution and its counter-image, like the environment, the vacuum, whatever you want to call it, the unique roots in the factorization of the LVA equation. And so consciousness can be included here as a counter-image. And as like the double helices of DNA and the human self-conscious the result of a quantum physical human brain struck mind with natural semantic capabilities. Um, uh, do, do, do stop there for a moment. Uh, can we think about that just a little bit? Sure. Uh, it's going a bit fast for me. Yeah, it's OK. Yeah. So do you want to say something? As well, do say that again. Right. We, we can include consciousness as a kind of counter-image. Go on, stop there. Yeah. Tell me what you mean by that. Well, um, it's hard to describe, but it's like our interaction with the environment. And so, it, whatever's there has a counter image in our consciousness. Ah, I see what you mean. Yeah. How do you answer the, the, the community that says, um, how do I therefore describe redness? Describe what? Redness. Or. or Queen, yeah. Well, this is very g general and generic. I can't actually describe no, it. No, 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 no. You know, well, that is the counter image of something that's out there. Yes, I mean, when, when you say the, the Dirac equation has got a, a connection with the rest of the universe, uh, the, the, that's where I think the subject consciousness could come in, that we are. Uh, that we are, that we have become aware that we are connected to the rest of the oh, universe, to the rest of the universe, and the rest of society. And things like that. So the system uh, responds to the, of the, sorry, the environment responds to the system. But well, here we've got the, the system responding to the environment. They say we are aware that we are aware. Of the effect. Sure, sort of, yes. I mean, it's, it's more a difficult language at this point. Well, I, 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 we haven't really got the language to discuss consciousness. We're not, we're not claiming that we've actually got a fantastic breakthrough. We're just no, 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 no. claiming that this yeah. is another example of the yeah. same kind of thinking yeah. that we're talking about. Yeah. See, for example, here we've got the counter image as applied to the nil Poulton Dirac equation. Uh, I mean, there's a very simple example that was uh, published by a man called Albert. Uh, he considered one person, he said, what was the difference between a, uh, a digital automata and a quantum automata? Well, apparently the quantum automata knows things about itself that it can't tell anybody else. It can't communicate to anybody else. Yes, I think that was you at the <laughs> well, that's because that's because we are if we are if we are quantum. this would be think because each of us would have a unique property. Oh, absolutely. In the whole universe, yes. that's something that is utterly us, and there's no way of it's a unique fact. Yeah, and there's no way of the other person of actually understanding. Yeah, sure. See, what we're saying here is that structures defined to have intelligence aren't any different from any others. Oh, well, now, careful, careful, careful. In, in, in requiring the non-local connection to produce self-organization. That's not the same thing as saying they're all different. 
in that cat in that principle. Yes, <clears throat> I think we have to be terribly careful about going from intelligence to consciousness. Yeah. I would okay. argue that take this separate. Oh, good. But I'm just saying. Yes. I'm talking about intelligence, here, not consciousness. Yeah, I'm, I'm trying to follow you as best I can. I'm not saying it's consciousness. I'm saying it's intelligence. Yeah. But at this point, is talking about the yeah, so I'm not talking about consciousness. And in that in that context, we need intelligent systems still have to connect to the rest of the universe to produce self-organization. And if we wanted to produce AI, we'd have to build this structure into the system. We'd have to build it in some way it interacts with its environment. In a way that you can't do with the Turing machine and digital logic because they don't interact with their environment. And that is always the key, it's the interaction with the environment. But we know how to make it interact with the environment in a sense. We do the reverse logic on it. And that is the interaction with the environment. Now maybe this might, it might explain how consciousness is able to operate. We don't know. Because we're a long way from understanding consciousness. But it, it is possible it could make the creation of artificial self-organizing systems more practical than they are. I'm not sure I particularly want that actually. <laughs> If you could sit, simulate the non multi connection digital, if you could. If I, uh, don't let's go down this line too far if you <coughs> I don't want to go down it very much. But um, the, um, I must admit, it's always seemed to me that the entire universe is self organizing and everything yes. in it is. Yes. And the only thing that isn't is our brain. Yes. Okay. Because we're the only people that can actually forecast what's going to happen in the future. Um, and therefore I'm interested in why do we want to actually create... I don't think we can. I'm hoping we can't. Because I don't like the idea of it. Okay. But I want to say that if, if you don't bring in the environment, then you can't do it. I'm not so keen that we want to do it. <laughs> I'm saying... We are saying nature will always be structured as a peer tennis skill because it doesn't know any other way of operating. Yes. So it's like something equivalent to the renormalization group will determine higher structures. So renormalization, renormalization group. Now this is, to, in answer to your biological question in some way, what we are saying is that if we've got a system, an information processing system, whatever happens, you have to find the right ingredients at the level you're at for that to operate. And there are certain ingredients it must have. Um, to me, to, to describe how living systems operate, it, it isn't really the correct thing to start from chemistry and say, ah, well, this molecule has that property and that has that property. You've got to say that the way it operates is according to an information processing system. And it therefore requires to find something that has those properties which may happen to be this chemical or that chemical or so on. You know, rather than building straight upwards from chemicals, I think we should think about um, understanding how it uses whatever's available to make that possible. In the same way as you get convergent evolution, it uses any genetic path to fit the thing into its ecological niche. I think there's something driving it which is not the chemistry something more, more uh, uh, informational structure. We say nature will always act in such ways to create a P, and so we can disregard the NP problem. I'm saying restructuring self-organization at all scales forced by the regulate principle. And what drives it is a double space, or space and anti-space, with the totality of the two being always zero. The P structures will be different at different scales, obviously. And, but something will always turn up to fill the spot. This is what we think is happening. It's the information process which drives everything, and something turns up to fill the spot. Yeah. Or uh, ultimately, uh, ultimately uh, something gets pulled out of this degenerate space, yeah. a new property. But might fulfill the might fulfill the spot. It's exactly what you get with renormalization. Might never have existed in the universe before. This is what happens in the renormalization group. You get a high level of physics, and something fills the spot. Something new fills the spot. You could argue that 
what fills the spot is, of course, the human brain. Well, the yeah. human brain must fill the spot yeah. at some yeah. stage. Yeah. It must do. Yeah. Because it is actually different from everything else that's kind of called. Yeah. It must fill the spot, but because otherwise it wouldn't be there. Yeah. But, uh, but it's, a, it's a difficult question to work out how, but it must do. Well, conditions at high scale will always determine what kind of bee emerges at lower ones. And we can always express that using the lead methodology. And I think it's because of this that we can use the human brain's mechanics to make sense of the universe and project downwards. So we project downwards because using similar mechanisms to observe ones. So that's what we do. We observe things and we project downwards to observe similar mechanisms. And that's because similar mechanisms are there. It's not obvious that they would be. It's not at all obvious. It's not at all obvious that you know, things at a low level <coughs> would resemble those at a high level. But well, they do. Peter, you talk about the universe, you know, uh, uh, getting the consciousness of the universe coming in. Yeah. But what about the connection of the geopathic field to uh, the combination between the two? The geopathic field? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I'm not quite sure what that is. Okay, that's, yeah, well, I'm, I'm sure there is some connection. Because that, that, yeah. that is quite powerful. <coughs> the, um, the, uh, I've got to say, I don't pretend that I or we know all the, all the connections. But I'm sure that there are many that we don't know. Yeah, I think it's like rings in the balance. Okay, look, what we look for. But, you know, but I mean, to my mates, in terms of that, well, one of them, there's a lot of show books, some papers whereby. Somebody had studied the European sparrow. The part of the European sparrow, the European sparrow uh, doesn't stay in Europe. It uh, it goes every winter to Africa. Okay. Yes. Uh, and somebody said, well, uh, uh, they, they you know they put a tag on it, a Victorian tag, mm. uh, and they were amazed to find that it actually uh, it actually flies at night. <laughs> okay, yeah. uh, 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 and they they were able to prove that in fact uh, in its in the uh, per, you know the, in, the, in the beak there's a special cell there's a special cell and there's something in, and there's one in, in its eye in, in one of its eyes as well and that's able I think that's able to uh, follow follow the magnetic lines of force yeah. which is just amazing. I mean, if we want to do anything like MRI, we need a colossal magnetic field. And yet, here's, here's uh, evolu evolution has found something in a, uh, a, a, in, in, a cell, in, a, in a cell and adapted it. It seems that like that the name of the, the spiral to It yeah. seems that a lot of these things are quantum mechanical as well. Just one little quantum mechanical process tips the balance. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Just one little thing, and it's sort of as though nature will find what it has to find.